Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody coming out. This is the biggest audience I've ever had. So <laughs> that, that's, that's nice by itself. I don't care about the rain. Uh, yeah, and I'm highly sought after. Because of this, I've got four more engagements the rest of this month <laughs> doing the same thing. So I, I was glad to set it all up. I've got slide presentation to go along with uh, the, the talk. I usually do the talk from memory, but because of the slides, I might look at this piece of thing every once in a while just to kind of make sure I'm on track. Again, thank you so very much. Thanks to the Historical Committee. I'm always pleased to tell a story. I love to go tell it to school kids, and you'll find out why in a little while. But uh, there it is. So here I am, a second lieutenant. Uh, and I had just graduated from pilot training. I was married. I had one child already. Uh, that was my previous wife. My wife, Linda, is here uh, back there. Say hi. There she is. Raise her hand. Uh, of 45 years, by the way, so that's good. Uh, and we have two kids of our own. Now, um, but then I was married and I had one child and uh, a pregnant wife. And I'm off getting ready to go to Vietnam. Well, the first thing that happened was that I had selected, because I thought in my young mind as a second lieutenant, that if I got the O2B, it was a newer model than the O2A. That's what you'd think. Well, the O2B turned out to be what they call a BS bomber, or it had loudspeakers that went around the neighborhood and told the, the Vietnamese that, uh, hey, you know, we're good, or told the bad guys, hey, give up, you know, and pass out bulletins and flyers and all that kind of stuff. That's what the BS bomber did, the O2B. Uh, so it didn't shoot anything, which is what I wanted to do, because I would I'd been in the Marines previously, and I was an expert marksman, an expert pistolman in the Marines and uh, in enlisted. Uh, so I wanted to shoot something as I went to war, if I was going to go to war. And so I found out that I wanted the O2A. So in the school where I was at, I was talking around to people just in the school. And I said, I'd like to switch. I'd like your airplane. He says, well, I don't want your airplane. So, you know, uh, so. We found another guy, and then that guy said, well, I'll take your airplane if you'll take, you know. And so we had a three-way switch going, and we called the personnel center in San Antonio, and they said, that's an outstanding idea. You all have verbal authority to continue and do what you need to do and cite me and so forth and so on, and away we went. So off I, off I was uh, into, I began O2 training, if you will. O2A training, forward air control. Forward air control. Uh, in this uh, airplane here was the, again, the O2A. You don't see rockets on it, but uh, we'll get to them in a minute. But the point is that uh, off I go to survival school. I leave on about uh, 11 uh, December of uh, 1968. And first you go to Oregon and you go through what it's like to be in, in an prison camp, and that was mighty, mighty tough. Uh, I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do, and mostly what not to do the hard way, because uh, they, were not, they were not nice if you screwed up. And, uh, but anyway, we went off. So that was about uh, four days of that. And then I went off to the Philippines. Now, in the Philippines, we go to what we call jungle survival school. And jungle survival school is uh, a 10-day, like I say, course. And the first guy I want to always remember is a guy named Sam. That's all I knew him as is Sam. But he was my instructor uh, among all of us. And, I'll always remember that guy for various reasons, but uh, uh, we went through that school, and we did as good as we could. We learned more about being in a survival situation. Uh, so this is on the 
well, through the 15th of December. Then the next place you go, and as I was, oh, I, I want to tell you about flying into Saigon real quick. Flying into Saigon, I'm on a plane full of airmen, Marines, Navy, everybody, you know, we're all sitting there. There's about 250 of us on this TWA Airlines or whatever it was that flew into, flew into Saigon. And, you know, we were all talking and doing our thing. But in the last 10 minutes approaching Saigon, it was total, absolute silence. And everybody was looking out and they were, you know, we were all afraid we were going to get shot down going into Saigon, first of all, you know. So it was total, absolute silence. We landed and uh, it was all just, well, not welcome to Saigon. So the next day, after finding a place to stay, and we were going to stay in Saigon for about two days, I went to this big auditorium uh, where all of us gathered, uh, three or four hundred of us gathered around. And uh, one of the speakers, I remember, said to me, and to all of us, well, all of us, he said, uh, Look to the man to your left and look to the, well, look to the person to your left and look to the person to your right. And we were all flyers, by the way. We were all flyers. He says, one of you is going to take a hit in your airplane during your time here in Vietnam. That are the statistics. One of you will take a hit in your airplane. And I look to my left, which is my right here, on my left. And uh, the guy to my left was, in fact, one of the guys that I made the three-way switch with. And I said, well, you know, aren't you lucky? Because <laughs> he wasn't going to go to where he was going to get shot at, you know. So. so I figured it was between me and him kind of a thing. So anyway, we went. And then the next place we went was to Happy Valley. Well, Happy Valley was our in-country, if you will, training school to learn how to fly the O2A in a combat simulated situation. You know, but uh, the place was called Happy Valley, and I don't even remember the name of the air, the air force or air base that it was. But it, we called it Happy Valley because we were just simulating; we were still simulating war. However, the first night I was there, we had a mortar attack, and you know everybody, you know, put on your motor, or your jacket, your light, your, your um, flak jacket, and, and uh, get under the bed and. And thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that was, you know, that broke, broke me in pretty good to uh, what it was to be a shot at. So after finishing Happy Valley, well, one of the things I witnessed there was the puff, the magic dragon, the, the gun that could shoot like thousands of rounds of 30 mil or uh, 7.62 millimeter down you know, with a Gatling gun down at the enemy, you know, it'd shoot out the le left side of its aircraft and just go around, or maybe the right side, and, uh, and it was just, uh, it would wreak havoc on the ground, and, and uh, I loved the effect of watching that at night. It was a, a good airplane. So off we left Happy Valley, and now it was a question of trying to get to Da Nang, well, I'm still on verbal orders because I still don't have a piece of paper in my hand that goes to, says go to Da Nang. So I show up at the gate, and they say, you got your orders? And I say, yeah, I'm going to Da Nang. They said, good. And that's all they wanted to know. They didn't want to read the paper or anything else. They just want to know that you had a, something that looked like a set of orders and that you wanted to go to Da Nang. So you got on the plane to Da Nang because the other one was going to uh, uh, NKP, not NKP, but um, I'll think it Fubai. So anyway, um, off we go. And so I got to Da Nang and showed up per uh, my instructions. And I arrived there on the 30th of, uh, 30, or the 1st of January, 1969. Happy New Year. And by the way, Tet, Big Tet that was a bad deal back in 68, with January of 68, January 1 of 68, that was what we were worried about when we got to Da Nang, was that they were going to have another Tet, and that was the big worry. So uh, it was just a little nervous, but all we got was another mortar attack, you know, on Da Nang that night, and that's, that's all there was. So... Uh, then I found out that I couldn't fly until I had a set of orders that actually said, you can now fly the O2A. So I had to wait around for 10 days 
waiting for that set of orders to come in from the states over the wires, however they did it, and make sure that everything was correct. And so I didn't actually start flying until the 11th of January, 1969. And I was on, by the, I flew uh, with different CTIPs. A CTIP is the instructor in the right seat. He's called a combat training instructor pilot. And all he's doing is taking you out into the war zone and actually doing stuff that's associated with war. And so we did that. And uh, we did that, I did that s six times. And on the seventh mission, which was on the 18th of, of uh, January, we took off about noon, and I'm flying, and my right seater was, I'm a second lieutenant, my right seater was a Major Blair, George Blair. I call him George now. Back then, I called him Major, of course. But uh, we went out, and we got the word from the command and control system that they had. It's called the ABCCC, or Airborne Command and Control Center. And they, we were going to transfer with another Cubby pilot. I was Cubby 264. And uh, we were going to change airplanes. And uh, we, we headed out. Now, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can do this right now. Da Nang is right about there. And that's where we flew out of. And we flew into Laos, which is across this border coming down, and you can see that little loop in the river with the, well, that's significant as we go along here. But uh, we flew from there out there, and that was about uh, a 20, 25 minute flight to get out there. And as we're headed out there, I'm getting this briefing on, okay, I just left, I, I didn't get the two trucks. There's two trucks in a Ford in this river that you see there, and uh, you still need to hit them. So I did what I was supposed to do. I called the AB Triple C and I asked for a flight of F4s to come, come fly and, and hit that target. And uh, so I went through all the process that you go through. I shot a couple of Willy Peets at it. Willy Peet is a white phosphorus rocket. There it is in the lower right hand corner there. You can see that that's a tube of about seven Willy Peet rockets. We called them white phosphorus. And all they did was blow up white smoke. Uh, but they had a, because of the phosphorus, it was uh, dangerous all by itself. So as we're going along and flying, uh, you usually fly in a left-hand turn. Because in the O2, if you'll look there, I was flying in the left seat. And uh, the. Uh, I was, so I had to look out the left seat because Major Blair, uh, George, was in the right seat. I couldn't see, see out that side. So he always flew kind of in a left turn around the target. So I had put in the strike. We'd hit the trucks. I was happy. I pulled away from the target. And George said, let's take another look. So as we did that, and I wish I should almost have a chair up here as a prop. But as we did that, whoomp. The back end of the airplane uh, got hit, and uh, it just—it was just kind of a whoop, and, and the plane just immediate, and it was whoop. The hit was right there where this—you uh, can see that come up into there. The hit was probably right there. I don't know exactly where it was, but I think it was there because what the plane did was like if I was sitting in that chair and I just started spinning around sideways in left turns. And it was a good thing it was left turns, by the way. But it was in left turns, and it was flat, flat, flat. And I got on the radio, and I hollered, mayday, mayday, mayday. And that was a lot. And then I'm trying to recover the airplane, and you're trying everything, you know, do this, do that. And Nothing was working. George was over there trying to do the same thing I was doing. We were just kind of like, what do we do? And I looked at him. I said, we got to get out of this thing because the plane had stopped spinning and kind of like pointed straight down. So we had about four or 5,000 feet to go. I have no idea really how high we were. But I could look down, and I could see the spot where we were going to hit. And I just picked it out, and I said, 
And so I started nudging him, and he thought, he, he thought at the time that I was trying to crawl over him. I said, no, I was trying to get you out of the way because there was no way I was going to crawl over you. But we have an action that we have to do. I have to unlock the door on the right side, and he has to pull a handle down in this low, by his right knee. So he had to pull that handle, and he wasn't pulling that handle. He was just trying to still recover the airplane. So I'm reaching over there, trying to reach in front of him to pull the handle. And he, he realized what I was trying to do. He pulled the handle, then his job was to knock on the door. The door would fall off because that handle pulled the hinges, or the pins out of the hinges. So that door fell off, and uh, he started to go, and I realized that he hadn't unlocked his seat belt. <laughs> So I'm reaching for his seat belt now, and his hand actually beat me to it. By the way, temporal distortion, if you ever heard of it, what it is is what happens to you when your life is in danger and all you're trying to do is survive. Everything slows down, and everything that happens in that time is burned into your memory for life. I've had it happen to me five times in my, in my career. I'd had it happen to me once before, uh, when I was in a, uh, my, my, my new Mustang 67 on a wet road. And I went into a spin, and I can just remember sitting there and saying, okay, if I hit my brakes right about now, it'll be good. And I hit my brakes, and I, it stopped, and it stopped, and it snapped around, and everything was worked great. You know, but you're in the survival mode. That's what that slow motion is. You don't hear anything. You don't remember hearing anything. It's all there. So this is what was happening to me as I'm doing all this with George. Uh, I'm in this survival mode. He hits the thing and he undoes his belt and he goes out the window. I remember hearing a thud. I didn't think I heard, but I can remember the thud. I thought about it afterwards and I said, that must have been him thudding real hard on the strut of the airplane. And you can, you can see the strut right there. That's the 37 millimeter that, uh, not the one that hit us, but of course, but it's what, it was what was shot at us at the time. He knocks himself out, but I didn't know this. I didn't know anything. All I was doing was undoing my belt and, and diving after him. So I dove out and away from the strut like I was trained to do. I got out, and you pull on your ripcord, and you're only supposed to have to pull so far on your ripcord. And I'm in slow motion, so it's not, nothing's happening. You know, nothing's happening. Nothing could happen fast enough for you at that point in time. So nothing was happening, so I went and I pulled on it, and then I came back here and I pulled on it again, and I had that much cord in my hand. Uh, they told me afterwards that that's impossible. I said, guess what? I did it. I remember this motion. I remember it being at this level. Anyway, when I did that, the chute finally started opening. I could feel it opening. And when, it, you know, when the wump happened, I, that's when temporal distortion left, and I was back in real time. Everything was real time to me. I looked up. I saw my chute. I heard a crash. I looked down, and there was the plane below me burning away. And I, as I was looking down, I saw George do this. His chute opened and closed that quickly. I mean, he just had time to stop and uh, slow down enough that he, but he hurt his leg in the process. But he just barely opened. I'm still 1,500, 2,000 feet up in the air looking down at this. And uh, he landed 15 feet to the left of the airplane. I'm coming down, and now I hear the shooting. The, guys are, the bad guys are shooting at me, lots of rifle fire. So I start swinging. And I've always said over time, I said, I didn't know if it would work. I had no clue if that would work. Here I am up here, you know, just, you know. But they didn't hit me, so it worked. <laughs> That's all I know, you know. So anyway. Uh, I came down 15 feet to the right of the airplane that was burning right here. I came down through a tree, and my leg got scraped up pretty good. Uh, but I hit fine. My chute was caught in the tree. I just unbuckled it as quickly as I could, and I pulled on it, because that's what you're supposed to do to try, because you're supposed to bury it. 
well, I was being shot at, and I'm thinking, they already know I'm here. I think I'll just leave it. And off I ran away from the ground fire that was coming, you know, the rifle fire that was tracking me, sort of. So I ran, and I started up this path. I was on a path. And Sam, remember Sam, talking to me. He's sitting on my left or right shoulder right now. He says, you need to get off this well-worn path, because somebody else is using it, too, you know? So um, I, I ran until I got to a point. I said, well, I got to cross this brook. There was a brook right here. And I got to cross this brook. So I, as I came to it, I said, OK, I'll jump across the brook. Well, I left a footprint on the far side of the brook. I can remember leaving a heel print you know, as I dug in. And that thing bothered me, still bothers me <laughs> sometimes. But I left a footprint. And I thought, I, I looked back and I saw it filling up with water. But it just kind of had that shape you know, that made you think, eh, maybe somebody might see a footprint there. But anyway, I, got up, I crawled up, ran up a little ways on the hill, not very far, maybe from here to, to Ron. You know, and and uh, I, I, uh, I said, OK, there's a bush. And I literally wrapped myself around the bottom of the bush. Uh, and, and, I, and I just kind of laid there and waited. And the gunfire was still flying at me. But I, I, I think they were just shooting just to try and scare me or keep me running or whatever. I don't know, but I just found a bush and I wrapped myself in a gray flight suit with a white helmet on. OK? And uh, I said, well, first thing I got to do is dig a hole. So I got out my knife. I dug a hole real quick. And I stuffed my helmet in it. I had a gold pin, a uh, cross pin. In my, in my sleeve pocket, I threw that in there, and I threw uh, a book. I had a book. It was uh, T.E. Lawrence. T.E. Lawrence was a big movie back in that time, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And I had his book, which was Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and I'd been carrying it around in my pocket. And I said, well, I don't want them to find me with this. So I'll bury that in that hole with that helmet as I'm digging away and covering it up. And I said, OK, now I'm, now I'm OK. And or more or less, but I'm trying not to sit up and I'm doing this from a laying position the whole time. So all of that happened. Then I started spitting on mud uh, to try and get it wet so that I could cover my, my wonderfully white face. And by the way, my hair was very orange at that time. It was very orange. Uh, 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 and uh, so I was m rubbing dirt in my hair to, and spitting on it to try and get it muddied up and, and wet too. And so I was just trying to get as camouflage as I could as I laid there. And uh, so I'm waiting, and the gunfire is happening, and I can hear the bullets ticking around the trees all around, kind of a thing. And uh, so I'm waiting, and of course I'm waiting for these guys, is what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for these. Uh, these A1E Sandys rescue helicopters, but I'm not hearing anything. And I must have been laying there for about two hours with them probably about 50 yards away, which to me was, you know, just outside the door here kind of a thing, maybe 50 yards away, shooting up the bushes, not knowing exactly where I was, apparently. But the bullets were ticking around, you know, high in the trees, low in the trees, whatever. <laughs> they. Um, They, uh, let's see what I want to, I'm sorry, I got lost for a second in my head. He's, they're, they're shooting at me. Oh, George, oh, I start to hear the airplanes. That's what I did. I started to hear the airplanes after about two hours. But in this whole two hours up to that point, I started getting covered in ants. Ants from the hole that I dug, or ants from wherever, they just covered my body. And I mean literally everywhere that you could possibly imagine. I had ants all over my body. And uh, I was, I didn't care about them getting in my ears, because I figured my ears would keep them out, generally out of my brain, pretty much, you know. But they were trying to get up my nose and in my mouth and all this stuff. And all I worried about was my nose and my mouth. So I'm doing this. And I don't want to make a sound. And by the way, when I tell this to school kids, I say, 
making noise. You know, we're talking about making noise. And that's become more of a problem in the schools now. They, they have learned in schools, and they're teaching them a lot, don't make any noise. So the last school that I did this to, my granddaughter's school, I said, see if you can keep quiet for one minute, because I bet I can find you with my eyes closed, because you're going to make a sound. And for one minute, there wasn't a sound out of that class. And I said, I, I've done this, I'd done this about 10 times, and I'd, I never had anybody, I could always find somebody, you know, doing something, coughing, <laughs> clearing their throat or whatever. But uh, kids have learned to be quiet in school now because of the situation th that is in the world. <coughs> Ants, they're all over me. I'm trying to figure out what to do. I finally decided, Sam said, eat them. They're, they're protein. They are good protein. So I started eating them. I just, you know, chewing them up and crunching them and all that. They were a little crunchy, but they were t relatively tasteless. But I just started chewing on them left and right and as fast as I could. And I think the scouts or one of the scouts finally said, look, he's eating this. Let's get out of here. And suddenly they just left. They all left, and I have no clue why or to this day, but it felt like for two hours that I was being consumed by ants all the time trying to figure out what else is going on on the radio, trying to eat the ants and keep them out of my nose and ears and eyes uh, kind of a thing. So uh, kids love that part of the story. Anyway, uh, so now I hear George on the and he's talking to these Sandys that are flying overhead. These are called Sandys, the search and rescue airplanes. They're the best dang airplane that ever flew search and rescue. And they do a great job. But he's talking to them, and I'm hearing him talking about me being dead and so forth and so on. And they're having a good time trying to get him out of there. And I'm trying to get in there and talk. Well, I. The airplanes were, when the airplanes were flying directly overhead, I could talk on the radio. But you know what a radio does when you're talking on it, you go, you know, and, and, and even a voice sound, I didn't want to be heard. I didn't want to be heard by anybody. I was only 50 yards away from the bad guys, as far as I knew. As far as I could figure, I was about 50 yards away. So I talked, and I'd try and talk and try and remember to let off the phone before I took the cover off and all this stuff and listen. And they had this tube that covered the speaker on the phone. It was, or they had a cover and it had a tube out of it. And you were supposed to put the tube on it, listen to it. When you get ready to talk, you were supposed to hit this, lift the cover, talk, put the cover back in place, let go of the thing, and then listen again. And I couldn't, I couldn't arrange that in my mind for as anxious as I was to make contact. So what I did was I just left this thing on the speaker on the tube, and I started talking into the tube like this. And they understood me. <laughs> and they didn't, and we found out afterwards that this was new. They'd never known this before, that they would, so it worked very well as a little speaker, but you could muffle your voice a little bit and keep it low. And so, but they had, hurt, they had a hard time listening. But they thought I was dead, and they thought I was spoofing them that I was a bad guy trying to spoof them uh, and into coming in and, and helping me. And then I would shoot them up or something like that. Uh, you know, that's what they think when they do this. And finally, uh, they asked, uh, OK, we got another one down here. I don't know if he's spoofing us or not. I'm going, I'm going to get, a, get some information. So he went off and got the information. And uh, the, effort, the he comes back on line, and the lead, Sandy, says to me, he says, what's your favorite pie? I said, Aunt Martha's apple pie. He says, Sandy Flight, we got two. <laughs> I mean, and there's two of us now. So now he knew I was there, too. And he understood that I was there. So I wasn't dead, of course. And we'll talk about that in, in a little while. But. Uh, they knew they were going to work on George. And they all, all they wanted me to do was to come up on the radio, listen for a little bit, see if, if uh, they were calling me, and then get off and wait 10 minutes, save battery. 
Okay? So I would do that, and I'm waiting, and the bad guys are kind of sitting there waiting. And uh, they, they'd quit shooting, but I knew they were there. I could hear them talking, but I couldn't, I couldn't uh, they weren't shooting anymore. They were waiting. They were actually waiting for the helicopter to come in so that they could shoot at the helicopter, because that's what they do. So George uh, finally talks the first helicopter in. Well, George told them, Sandy, that he had been injured. His leg was hurt pretty bad. Well, I could imagine now that we know that he was probably coming down pretty fast when he hit the ground, and he probably went through a tree too or something like that, so I could imagine that. But one of the things I remember, oh, he was given his identification. He would have been asked, quote, what's your favorite drink? And one, uh, I have to tell you, and he said, uh, he said, whiskey and water. And I said, no, George, no. I remember last night you had a whiskey and ginger. <laughs> you know, and that's what he, but I did, you know, I just thinking to myself. And uh, yeah, I'm waiting to see if he's okay. And they, they passed it. Okay, so that was, that was good. Whiskey and, whiskey and water was, was his answer. And he, and he lived to tell about that. So anyway, they finally work and they bring in a, uh, the first helicopter. Now the first helicopter had a pararescue man on it, and they were going to put him down to help George get on the, get you know, hook him up and go up together. You know, like you've seen on the rescues on TV, they would two of them would go up together because George was injured and he, uh, so forth and so on. Well, uh, the first guy got about halfway down, or maybe very close to all the way down, and the bad guys opened up on him. And so that airplane, or that helicopter, takes off. The guy's hanging, okay, and he's taken off, and the helicopter takes off, and they pull him up in. And I didn't know whether that was George or what. I saw it go overhead, but uh, it took off. Well, I found out afterwards that it had about 50 rounds in it. Yeah. And uh, so then that didn't work. George was, and they were still trying to get George out. So then you know, they bring in the second helicopter. Now the second helicopter, I guess he told them, because I'm not listening all the time to everything that's going on, because I'm going up and down every 10 minutes or so. But uh, they, they don't put the PJ man down, or they don't have one, I don't know which, but they just put the penetrator down, and George got on that, and he got in it. But they did it from a lower altitude, so the bad guys couldn't see him so well over the top, so whatever was going on there. And uh, so he, he gets into the helicopter, and then he starts flying towards me, because that's what they were supposed to do next was, okay, I was supposed to come up and start talking that helicopter to me. So I'm saying 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, telling him what direction to go. 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock, you know, and then suddenly, boom, 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 the bad guys open up on that helicopter. And off it goes. And George told me afterwards, he said, the bullets were flying in there like crazy. And I was ducking down on the floor and everything. And I thought, would have scared me. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, uh, so he, that plane took about 50 hits also uh, from the bad guys. And off it went. And uh, then the Sandy lead, leader says, Sandy flight, go channel two. Well, when I heard that, I knew they weren't going to be able to get me out today. And uh, I, I, I went on and on about my grandmother in my head. I just, my grandmother, oh my God, yeah, I'm going to have to be left here and all that stuff. Uh, I had lived with my grandmother for several years uh, during high school. My parents had thought that it would, I would do better on the farm than I would in the city. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. <laughs> and, and so I learned how to be a farm boy uh, for a little bit and went to high school uh, with my grandmother as my mother. And uh, that worked out very well, and I loved her to death. And I, she had lost her second oldest son, Harold, as a first lieutenant navigator in World War II. He was flying B-24 Liberators, flying out of... Uh, uh, out of Europe there, and he, he was a submarine chaser, and he got shot down uh, and, uh, and was never found. He's MIA still, basically, uh, assumed KIA. Um, and my dad, by the way, just for information, my dad was a tank commander in World War II in Europe, 
Uh, but he was very lucky, as far as I'm concerned, from all the stories I heard about tanks and the longevity of a tank in World War II, but he was very lucky. Anyway, I didn't want my grandmother to lose me, too. <laughs> so that's kind of what was on my mind. But I said, I, I guess I'm a soldier. I've been a Marine. I was a soldier, and I, I guess I'm going to try till I die. That's all there is to it. I'll just try till I die. And we were told, by the way, in our briefings, in our intelligence briefings before we went out, save one bullet for yourself because they will skin you alive in Laos. They literally skin you alive if they capture you. And so we were supposed to save one bullet for ourselves, and I just, I knew I couldn't do that. But, uh, so uh, they did call back and they said, they told me, Covey, we gotta leave you. Uh, we'll be back in the morning and your signal to come up will be an F-100 going afterburner over your head. And I said, he said, that'll be the signal that we're ready for you to come up on your radio. Otherwise, stay off your radio all night, save your battery, and, uh, you know, we'll get you out. And I said, oh, okay, I got the works. And uh, so they left, and there was silence. You know, the silence of the planes being gone, it's getting dark now, it's still light. But, you know, it's getting dusky. And uh, these two or three or five, I, let's see, that was five. The other ones were two. There, about five guys started walking from the airplane nest that they had set up towards their encampment. And they walked right by, they walked on that path that I had been on, that well-trodden path that I originally was on. They walked right there. So they were probably 20 feet away from me. And uh, they're walking. And I can remember to this day, and I, I just remember it so vividly. That... No, no, no. No, 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 no. You know, and it kind of went like that. The whole conversation went like that. You know, this one guy was saying, and the other guys were saying, no, no, no. Well, I know that they were saying, there's one guy still down here. We ought to be looking for him. And the other guy was saying, no, there were two helicopters with two guys. You know, we saw them both hanging, you know. It's just, it's not so. It's not so. So they're going, oh, okay. And so they just kept on, and they went to the encampment. And, uh, and things were quiet, and they were very quiet. And the ants were gone. I was sitting there, and... I now had to pee very badly. But I knew that I wasn't going to sit up or stand up and do that. So uh, I decided that I would sit up and uh, a little bit and start peeing. Well, you know, when you're in the ground like that, you, you, you develop a puddle and it starts making noise. You know, a puddle makes noise when it's peed into. Then I went, stop peeing, let it sink into the ground and start over again, you know. So it took me about 15 minutes to pee, but I wasn't going to make any noise, <laughs> period, you know. So, uh, so I, got through, I got through that thing. Then I started looking at my equipment, and all my equipment, my, my spare battery for my radio, uh, the mirror that I had uh, was uh, in, in the... Uh, uh, orange panels that we had for putting out to spell something or say something with orange panels. Uh, those were all wrapped in this wax paper. And it was crinkly old wax paper. Now opening that was very noisy. <laughs> very, very noisy. As far as I was concerned, it was very noisy. And the encampment was only like about 75 meters away from me now. And I could hear them talking and talking to each other. So I said, you know. So I started, to, I had to open that stuff very, very slowly, very slowly until I could slip it out and then put it, you know, put it in a hole and bury it, you know, kind of making as little noise as I could. Everything that I had to unwrap, my, my, uh, my, my uh, red phosphorus bullets, I had red phosphorus bullets that was, you know, supposed to, mark your position at night if you needed them, kind of a thing, and, and the mirror and the radios and other, oh, a compass I had and all that stuff. So 
the crinkly paper was just too much noise. So I got that all done, and I'm setting everything up around me, and I'm good, and I'm sitting there, and then it starts getting darker and darker and darker, and it's just darker than, you know, and I can't see the, my hand in front of my face. And I went, okay, here it is. And I laid back. I took the orange panels. I put them back as a pillow, and I kind of laid back, and I just waited. And planes flew overhead. And then pretty quick, I hear uh, in the distance, I hear a gunshot. I hear a rifle shot. Boosh. You know. And then a little while later, I hear another one. Boo. I start to hear an airplane. And then a little while later, I hear a closer one. Boo. You know, and I'm thinking. And I hear the plane louder. And I realized that this was, you know, they didn't, Path It Loud didn't have radar. What they had was a signaling system that said, hey, everybody, listen up. There's a plane coming here, so you know, be on the alert. And the, somebody would fire a rifle shot every once in when it was overhead, about every five minutes, or you know, every two or three minutes. I don't know what it was, but anyway, about every two or three minutes, they'd fire a rifle shot. You knew that the plane was getting closer to your position, as opposed to the rifle shots going that way, where it was, might have been going to that position. So that we learned about what was going on in Laos, how they were, how they you know, developed a radar system, if you will, uh, kind of a thing, uh, kind of a thing. So um, we got them. That was all good. And then it was time to relax again. And I saw the, uh, the gunfire from the A-37, or the, uh, the AAA, the uh, 37 millimeter that I had talked about earlier uh, there. I saw it shooting up into the air, and I knew that that was happening over there. So the, okay, so I knew the 37 millimeter was there. Then I heard some trucks coming down the road, and they stopped, and they stopped in an embankment or in a parking spot about uh, 30, I'm sorry, about 200 meters t to my northwest. Okay, so I have the encampment, 50, the 37 millimeter, about 300, 400 yards that way, the truck park, uh, the the airplane was over there, and then about 8 o'clock at night, I started hearing this, and it was just like a, a, I've always described it as jeans in a clothes dryer, big, you know, those commercial clothes dryers, kalonk, 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 or a lasso, or, or some kind of rope maybe or something, but it was just going around and around and around, and I could hear this sound going on, and it went on constantly, and that was about 100 to 250 meters. I had no idea for sure, but you know, that direction, and so the compass that I had, uh, we had a way, we, I knew at the time that if you clicked off every, every click on the compass, so all I could see was the two dots. One was a, one on the compass ring and one on the needle. So when I put them together, I knew I was pointing north. So north was behind me, and I was looking south, and uh, basically. And so I started clicking things off from north, and uh, I said, okay, the factory's about, you know, and I burned it into my memory that it's about 100 degrees at up to 200, 100 to 200 yards or meters that way. We always talk meters, and by the way, a meter is almost a yard or a little bit more than a yard. So that's pretty easy. Anyway, uh, so I got that clicked off, and then I said, okay, we'll go around, and I'll, I'll say, okay, the encampment, where they were all talking and partying all night long, was at such and such a heading, and then the gun was at such and such a heading, and the truck park was at such and such a heading. And I just burned that into my memory, and I wrote it down and repeated it several times. I probably checked it two or three times uh, through the night, just because I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> but then as I'm laying there, and I'm laying there, and uh, uh, suddenly I hear voices. And it's like two or three guys are talking. And they're getting louder and louder and louder. And they walked up behind me, they were coming from my left rear, and they walked, and they were lit, and I'm sitting down there, or no, I, at this time I was laying back, because I had the orange things under my head, pulled the orange things out, hit them, turned my face away, held my pistol right here, and I realized how brave I was. I'd probably take on two or three guys, 
you know, because I'll die if I, if I do anything else, I, you know, because I only had six shots in my pistol. So two or three guys was probably about max that I figured I could handle. And there were two of them, so I said, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, you know, and I'm just sitting there waiting. I'm sorry, I lost my balance, closed my eyes. <laughs> uh, so I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and, and they just walked by and they literally walked like two feet away from my head. And they just kept on talking. They went down to the encampment somehow or other and they got down to the encampment and talking away. And I, I'm glad nobody was looking for me really hard that night. But I couldn't imagine that they could walk through that jungle without a flashlight. So I was, you know, like trying to check the ground or something, but nothing. So I went, well, okay. I felt good. So I'm laying back down. I got through that one. Everything was then suddenly, then suddenly, you know. But uh, basically I'm laying there, and pretty quick I feel my hair being pulled. You know, and I'm like, and I jerked, and when I jerked, whatever rodent it was, took off. <laughs> I scared him by moving. I said, well, you're making too much noise, but come, if you come back, you can have all the hair you want. Mm -hmm. And this happened. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, uh, so he, he or she came back and uh, pulled more hairs out of my head, and uh, I just didn't bother moving or anything. I just let him do it, you know, because I didn't want to make any noise. Didn't want to make any noise. So as morning finally came, uh, all the confidence that I had through the night, which wasn't much, started to ebb away because now I could see better, but I could also be seen better again. But they had no clue I was there, so that was still good. So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and planes are flying overhead. And a friend of mine, he lives here in uh, York County now, Russ Howard, uh, was flying overhead trying to get me to come up on my radio. I, uh, I'm not coming up for him because he can't get me out of here, he, you know, by himself. He can, he can know I'm here, but it's not going to do me any good. I'm waiting until I hear that F-100 go overhead. Then I know everything's ready, and I'll wait. And I waited for another half hour or 45 minutes, whatever it took and uh, came up and finally he says uh hey cubby you know and i said here i you know the the f-100 went overhead and, okay so he says hey cubby you okay and i says yeah i'm fine i'm great by the way i got da 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 and i just couldn't you know i was talking very fast you know and he said whoa 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 slow down slow down slow down <laughs> we gotta we gotta get he said did you say like you said factory. You mean like a manufacturing plant? And I said, that's what I mean. Yeah, there's a manufacturing plant there. There's encampment there. There's the 30 Center and the truck park. And I'm, I'm going on. And, and uh, I see this. OK, 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 OK. So they're flying around. And they're making this noise. noise. So I feel like I can talk better on the, on the mic. And uh, uh, they say, well, we're going to have to work out. We're going to have to do a lot of work here before we try and get you out of there. So they started bringing in the F-4s uh, kind of a thing uh, sn with snake and nape and all that kind of stuff. And what I didn't know was that they also dropped, uh, dropped. Um, uh, I thought that they were dropping CBU, cluster bomb units, little baseball size uh, bomblets that would go off at random around an area they were basically anti-personnel weapons. But uh, I found out later that they didn't do that, but I thought they did. And the reason I thought they did was that in the next two hours where they're bombing away, I'm hearing this explosion, 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 all from over there at the factory. And uh, I had no clue that they'd Hello. Hit the factory, but they did. Uh, and uh, so then, but one time uh, I'm laying there and, uh, oh, I'm laying there and uh, a white phosphorus hits, I swear to God, it was like 10 meters away from me, just a little ways away from you. And it puffs up and it comes up over my head, you know, and, it, 
And I, I, I had to yell, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. Uh, that last one almost hit me. It was, okay, everybody knock it off. Let's stand by and let's re reassess what's going on. Well, all of this time, all of this time, the only place that I could see the airplanes fly by because of the jungle canopy was a split in the trees that were right through there. So every time they flew by, I could see them for about that much space as they flew by. And uh, so I got smart er again, and I pulled out my mirror. And this is the mirror <laughs> that I had. Now, sunrise is in the east, and the only place I could see him was to the west. And I didn't want to stand up and use this thing. You're supposed to look through here and aim it, and, you know, and do all kinds of things and find. There wasn't any of that going to go happen because I wasn't going to sit up or stand up any more than I had to. So I took the mirror and I'm flashing it, and I'm holding it, and the sun's coming in from over here, and it just I got it to where I could find a leaf that was up close to the flight path that they would use up in the tree up there, and I just. As I, as I see the plane come by, I'd start wiggling it around, you know, and kind of, after about two minutes of that, he comes on the line and he says, uh, hey, C Covey, are, are, are you hearing ground fire or is, or is that you with a, with a mirror? And I said, that's me with a mirror. He says, great, we got you. We know exactly where you are now. Okay. So, yeah, that last one was pretty close, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. So, anyway. Anyway, um, so they knew exactly where I was now, and they talked and they talked and they fought and they fought and they said, okay, now it's getting on time. We need to bring in some, we're going to use cabbage. I'm going to put this in my pocket. I'm always afraid I'm going to drop it, and I don't want to break it. <laughs> I've carried it around with me for years and years because it's the thing that saved my life as much as anything. Um, so we're going to bring in some uh, salad. And I, the code word, salad was the code word for tear gas. Can you handle it? Can you handle it? We're going to spread tear gas all over. He said, can you handle it? I said, yeah, I can handle it. Because remember, I said I was in the Marines. When you're in the Marines and your last name is Townsley, you're put in this shed with about 50 or 75 other Marines. And you're singing the national anthem and the Marine Corps hymn. And then they call you out alphabetically. And being Townsley, I was towards the end of the line, so I was very used to it. I got outside, and my nose was clear, and I felt great. Okay, So they covered the whole area in gas, tear gas. And I'm fine, more or less. I mean, I'm bothered by it, of course. But uh, there it was. And so now I see the helicopter, and he says, start talking to the helicopter and bring him on in. I said, okay. And uh, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, you know, yada, 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 get him to me. And he gets right about there. And the, I see the penetrator coming down, and I'm ready to get up and go get that penetrator as he gets a little bit closer. And he's ready to stop, because that's what he was supposed to do, stop for a moment for me to get to the penetrator. And he got there, and then he just started going zoom, and he just flew on by me. Low level, penetrator dragging on the ground. And I said, well, it's do or die. I got to do it. So I picked up my radio and my gun, and I ran after it. And as it, you know, because it was blowing down the brush that was, or the trees and the brush that was in the jungle. So it was blowing that down. So I'm running after it, running after it, and I'm tripping over some of the things. And I, when I'm, I'm, I was a judo, I was a third belt judo guy back then. You know, so I'm tripping over and, and catching up and getting on my feet. And uh, I, I finally catch up to it. He finally stops just enough for where I can catch him. And I got on that penetrator. And the penetrator is a, doohickey where three arms fold down uh, and uh, you just you just pull it down and you sit on it and you up you go and they started pulling me up well it had been dragged through the forest or the jungle for yay long 100 meters or so I don't know how far I ran but I remember flying running past the the plane that was shot down I flew I ran past that 
I didn't see the factory, which I thought was in that general area, but I, didn't, I wasn't really looking real hard either. Um, but I got on the penetrator, and then I started going up. And as we're going up, uh, that thing was spinning. And all it did was spin. I mean, as fast as. And I'm sitting there with my gun going around and around and around and around and around. And around. And I said, I don't know if I can hit anything, but I'm going to shoot <laughs> you know, if I see something. And I, I was just spinning and uh, all the way up to the top. And finally, they got me to the top, and they stopped my spinning. And they pulled me inside slowly. I mean, everything was slowly now because I had the gun in my hand. I had a live gun in my hand. So they pulled me in and they slowly, they just slowly, like they literally took my fingers one by one, took them off the gun, slowly peeled it out of my hand, and uh, they unloaded it and put it away. So that's not me. But there is me, you know, sitting down. They had a photographer on board because what did they have out there? They had a second lieutenant. They never had a second lieutenant shot down the jungle before, so they wanted to get pictures of the second lieutenant. So they sent out a helicopter or a, a photographer <laughs> with with the rescue guys. So you can see, I don't know as you can tell that that guy that's kind of baldish there is crying, but he's crying. I'm crying. This guy here. He's crying, trying to, you know, fix his face up. And I'm looking at him, wondering, you know, what the heck's going on? Well, the next thing they told me was uh, that you are, you're going to start shivering. You're going to start shaking and shivering. And you won't be able to control it, so don't try. Just lay down and enjoy. You know, we'll cover you with a, we'll cover you with a, with a blanket, and you're going to, be okay. It was a, the adrenaline was, you know, rapidly, you know, transferred to my body from wherever it came from. You can see by my watch uh, that it's about quarter to 11, which meant that I had been down 22 hours, uh, approximately, or quarter to, I'm sorry, quarter to 12. I don't know. Anyway, I figured out it was 22 hours, pro approximately, 22 or 23 hours, uh, kind of a thing. And uh, off we flew back to Nacom Phnom, NKP. I hadn't been to NKP yet. Of course, I hadn't been in Vietnam very long either. I'd only been flying for seven days. <laughs> and uh, so I hadn't been to NKP. But uh, when I, I said, they said, what do you want? And I said, oh, I want a beer when I get there. That would be nice, you know. And a ham sandwich and a beer would be great. And they said, roger. And so they met me with a thing of milk and water. And, and uh, <laughs> ham sandwich, and they said, can't have any beer until after you see the flight surgeon. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine. So, uh, so they got me in there, and, and by the way, during this time, uh, uh, the, I got debriefed, and it took a long time to debrief, but one of the last things they said to me was, you, uh, you may have been called MIA you know, to, you, to your mother and father. You may have been called MIA. Uh, we don't know, but you may have been. And so you, you ought to call somebody. So you get, back in those days, you know, we, all we had was this uh, high-frequency phones where you, you say, I love you, over, and you know, I love you, over, I'll see you, bye, over, you know, and so forth. And everything was over, over, over. And I got on the phone to my ex-wife, and I said, have you heard anything about me lately, over? And she just screamed. So I said, I think she must have heard some. <laughs> and that was the end of the phone call because it was, it was like, I don't know, 2 o'clock, 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the signals, the sound, or the waves weren't good for phone calls in those days. So that was the end of the phone call. And I let it go because I've heard the screams. So she knew I was alive. And she would tell everybody else. But this is the MIA that was sent out on me. Uh, now, here it is. Uh, in, in, I wrote it better so that you could read it better, I hope. Maybe you can't, but you know, deep personal concern that I officially inform you that uh, I'm missing in action. Southeast Asia had to be suspended because of darkness, but will resume at daylight. <laughs> Lieutenant Townsley may have been captured. For his welfare, as recommended, uh, you don't give out any information, basically. And uh, please be assured that any new information will let you know immediately. And you may call my personal representative. And, General Dixon. 
so forth and so on. So that's basically it. Uh, now, uh, when I debriefed with Intel, um, I said, well, I, I was laying there counting. I mean, you know, part of the time I'm sitting there waiting for you guys to do all your strikes and all that stuff, and I was counting the CBU that was going off. Over he says, hey, counselor, we didn't use any CBU. We wouldn't use CBU in this kind of a situation. That's anti-personnel, and you're a personnel, so we're not going to use it anywhere around you. So what you were probably hearing was secondary explosions from that factory, and that was probably a little ammo factory of some kind or another uh, here in the thing. And so we're going to give you credit for it because of all the explosion, the secondary explosions. I mean, there were thousands of secondary explosions. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm counting them and thinking, you know, that's the CPU that's going off that we, but turned out to, turned out as far as they're concerned, as far as the Intel was concerned, it would be the factory. So anyway, I got back home, finally. My, uh, my ops officer, who was Major Anillo, he met me at NKP and he said, you're going to Bangkok with me. We're going to spend three days in Bangkok. So I arrived in Bangkok with no clothes, no money, uh, no nothing. And he goes off and he has a merry old time. And he says, OK, we're here. We're in the hotel. I'm paying, I'll pay for the hotel or see if you can get some money and then you can pay for it. You know, he was one of those guys. You know, I mean, not a very nice guy for being my new boss, you know, kind of thing. But anyway, uh, he turned out to be pretty, really pretty good. But um, the point is that uh, uh, the first thing I did, well, I, I went to the bank or to the, um, to the hotel manager. And I said, I, I have no money. How can I get money? You know, he says, well, I don't know. He says, how about you write a blank check on a piece of paper? It had bank name, amount, Signature. I think that's about all they had on there. So I filled it out, and he said, now you have to know that it's going to bounce, but you'll have money for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and you can take care of it later. And I said, OK, well, let's make it for $50, you know, back in those days. 1969, $50, fine. I'm in a, a hotel. So I immediately went to the slot machines in the uh, hotel, because they were they were kind of favorable, and I turned that $50 into like 150 in no time at all. And I said, no, well, that's the end of that. So I went off and bought some clothes that I could wear, you know, kind of a thing, and, and, uh, and I had a good time. I, I hit a couple of places, you know, sightseeing tours and things like that, and just, just had a, a very good time. But uh, that was my three days in Bangkok. Then... Um, uh, so now I'm back to, I, I get back to Da Nang, that's the next thing we do is get back to Da Nang, and there's George. And he says, well, you, George says, you were, you know, I mean, it's like, I got a couple of vet buddies in here, you know, they, they're going to give me hell Monday, you know, <laughs> or, uh, because uh, they're going to tease me about different things. But anyway, the point is that, this, you know, he's, they, they were saying, well, what were you crawling over George for to try and get out of the airplane? You know, like you were going to leave him there or something. I, I wasn't trying to crawl over him. I was trying to do this, you know, yeah. trying to explain everything. And, and George says, well, it sure felt like you were trying to crawl over me. I said, well, I wasn't. I was just trying to do things that I didn't think you were going to do, sir. You know, cause, sir, everything was sir and be polite, you know. Kind of. But uh, the... Uh, the uh, Anyway, I told him, I said, George, you knocked yourself out. You had to knock yourself out when you went out of the airplane. He said, no, I didn't. I, he said, I don't know how you got out, but I didn't knock myself out. I said, yeah, you did, because here's what I saw. You know, I'm telling him the story and all. He said, wow, I didn't know that, you know. And, of course, he's walking around with a, with a cane because he really did hurt his leg pretty bad. He, he couldn't fly for about a month after that. But uh, anyway, they... Uh, and I, you know, I and he was telling me about the 50 bullets flying around in the in the thing and all the different. So we traded stories, 
And then we were done, and that was the end of it. And uh, my boss, the, the commander of the outfit, uh, he says, uh, okay, we can put you in. You know, oh, first thing he said was, well, you know, if you'd been down there 24 hours instead of just 22 and a half or 23 hours, you could have gone home. I said, well, I'm going back, right? <laughs> Not, you know. I wasn't going to go back. I, I said, uh, unless you guarantee me the same results, which you can't. And uh, so anyway, uh, he said, well, you want a command post job? And I said, no, I don't want a command post job. I got to get back on that horse, which was my dad's training. Because my dad actually joined the Army when they still had horses in 1939. Because he loved horses. And we had horses wherever we went throughout life, uh, throughout his career, as I traveled with him. He was, he was actually a national, uh, national champion in, uh, in Austria at the Nas Austrian National Cup. And he was on his way to the Olympics kind of a thing, but he couldn't do it because of the military service. So it was, but he was a great horse rider. And so when I said the part about getting back on a horse, my nickname from then on was Cowboy for a long time because my bow legs helped, helped that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, my commander then put me in for a bronze star uh, because it was ground action that I had done and all this stuff, and that was all good. And I didn't know anything about it. Thank you very much, you know, and on and on and I went. And then about uh, uh, late October, from January to late October, November time frame, uh, they call up and say, well, you, you, you're now getting the silver star. Uh, it got upped at higher headquarters by the generals at B. They decided, so I got this, I got that. And uh, this is a citation that goes with it, uh, distinguished self. And I was just proud of it, and I, I, I don't know if you can read it very well or not. I can read it for you, but Armed Forces as a forward air controller directing fighter aircraft in Southeast Asia on 19 January. On that date, which is the first day of the rest of my life, by the way, uh, I, uh, in my capacity as a forward air controller, directed fighter aircraft against certain heavily defended hostile positions. After directing these aircraft, received a direct hit from hostile enemy, and he had to bail out. Upon reaching the ground, he continued the direct tactical aircraft aid, uh, affecting his own rescue as well as destroying a factory area in which he discovered during his 21 hours on the ground. But his gallantry and action and devotion reflect credit and so forth and so on. But uh, anyway, the, that was nice. That was, that was really nice. And this is General George S. Brown, who was the future chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That was his next assignment, uh, basically. And he just pinned it on. So I was, I was a proud puppy that day. <laughs> By the way, I made first lieutenant 10 days after I got shot down. So. so um, and that's uh, basically the rest of the story. Um, if you want to contact me and talk about it, uh, uh, Covey, no, no, well, first of all, Blister264, you saw my call sign was Blister, Blister264 at gmail.com. Call me at that number, and uh, that's fine, or you can just kind of put Bill Townsley, Yorktown, in, uh, on Google, and I'm all over the place because I got two websites, and I've been active in the community, as they said, so I'll be glad to talk. One of the other things I did in my life, in my retired life, was that I decided uh, my son was going to write a book, and we thought of the storyline, and then he decided he wasn't going to write the book, so I said, I'll write the storyline. And it only took me 20 years to do it, but I, I wrote a book. Now, one of the other things I did was that I started a youth leadership conference back in 2002. And we do that annually up in Jamestown at the 4-H up there. And that costs money. And I, and you, maybe you saw Earl Johnson, he's sitting out there with Jim Rice. Major Earl Johnson and Jim Rice. Well, Earl's my, uh, the director of the YLC now, and I'm just the fundraiser and whatnot. But any money that you, I got the books for sale. So if you'd like to contribute five bucks toward that effort, I'll be glad to sign a book. He's got a few for sale back there. If anybody would like to buy a book, it's called Ironic Justice. It's on Amazon. 
And oh, by the way, you know, it's just a murder mystery that'll blow your socks off because it's got a, it's got a twist that nobody's ever, I've never heard of before. So it's got a good twist to it. And everybody likes it. Right, Paulette? Right, Linda? <laughs> Who else has read that in here? I forgot. Earl read it. Yeah, and it takes place locally here in, here in Hampton. I, I make it take place here locally. Bill, so. we've got time for a few questions if you want to take some. Oh, I don't want to take any. Um, <laughs> but if, if you would, uh, if you would just uh, raise your hand so that they can call on you rather than everybody at once, if you have any questions. Bill, where did you get that beer? Well, uh, very shortly after I finally got out of the uh, Intel debrief, which took about two or three hours, by the way, the, uh, the idea of hooking or talking through the tube, that was a new idea that they weren't ready for. Uh, so that was a new idea. The flash in the mirror, they thought that was cool, the way I did that, which was not the way it was designed to view, but, you know, it worked. And, the, uh, and all, well, forever after that, for all the equipment that we got uh, assigned or put in our life, uh, they wrapped it in a, kind of a cloth instead of <laughs> wax paper. And I wouldn't go out and back out with, with that wax paper in there. I said, I have to have cloth. And they said, I think we'll do it to everybody's, you know, because it's a good idea. Anyway, so those are three things that I'm proud of, if you will. I'm proud of a lot of things, but, yeah. Did you ever take some orders? Oh, yeah. I mean, I couldn't fly until I got them. So I actually did get the orders to fly. Yeah. Yep. So. Oh, well, he said, did I get a beer? And so, yes, I went to the club. But did you go fly again? Oh, yeah. I, I, well, after I, after I got home and he asked me, you know, he made me sit around. The commander made me sit around for a few days to make sure that I wasn't crazy and, you know, and I could still take living in Da Nang and during the war and so forth. I mean, you know, the little things that you would do probably for your people. And then after about three days, he decided to fly me, not in the right in the left seat, but in the right seat with somebody else to see if I could handle being out and being shot at again. And I was fine with that. And uh, so we, so then I could fly by myself uh, uh, again. And I didn't need any more training, he, they said. <laughs> I, uh, they didn't give me any more training with, you know, usually when you get a CTIP to train like Major Blair, I'd been out on those seven missions and uh, uh, I was supposed to like get probably 10 more missions with somebody in the right seat. But they said, we're writing that off. You don't need that anymore because you're fine. So, and uh, so there I was. You saw a blister up there because in 1984, now this is many years after, 69, 84, I found out and when I got to Germany, 84 actually, 80, 80 no, I'm sorry, 70, 77 to 80. That's when we were in Germany. So in 77, I'm sorry, it was a few later, uh, I found out that the guy, a guy I had flown with in, on tour, on, uh, on uh, missions over there, uh, an army guy that I went out and worked with him, uh, he had been uh, killed in Africa because he was a mercenary. But he had the call sign Blister, and I loved that call sign. I just always loved calling him Blister, and I thought that was a great call sign. And when I found out he died, I said, well, I'm going to carry that call sign on because I think it's a great call sign. And uh, anybody can have it when I die, but, uh, you know, kind of a thing. But uh, anyway. It's I think we're going to have to wrap it up now. Okay. Uh, Bill, I'd like to thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much, Captain. I, I, I truly appreciate it.